afternoon, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, so as was said, I'm Tommy Lube. I'm, we'll talk about managing teams and share some of my experience with you. Um, and then I'm happy to uh, take questions uh, at the end. Um, I'll talk about managing difficult teams, but, but I'll sort of talk a little bit broader than that as well and draw upon my experience where I started managing teams was at the London Stock Exchange uh, a long time ago, uh, early on in my career when I uh, had my first team of sort of two or three people and what was that experience like. I went on to manage teams at PricewaterhouseCoopers, the management consultancy where I worked for four or five years. And there I was managing project teams um, and sometimes consultants, sometimes client staff, sometimes mixed teams, generally project oriented rather than day to day uh, management and generally with motivated uh, groups of people. Um, I worked at Goldman Sachs for a while and there was leading teams of extremely competent people that you almost didn't have to manage at all but you had to make sure they were pointed in the right direction because you knew that they would just go off at 100 miles an hour um, and when i was the chief information officer at uh, the internet bank eggs which we launched uh, quite some time ago there i had teams of upwards of 500 people and again, that was a different style of management. How do you manage 500 people, 1,000 people, and, and so forth? And then on the charity side, as was mentioned, I've done quite a lot on that side with creating schools like Hammersmith Academy, uh, which was a project that took six years from start to finish and involved managing multiple uh, stakeholders. Um, and, uh, and so, and politicians and government and, and so forth. So again a different style of management and then as was mentioned my latest charitable project where we set up the African Science Academy a uh, girls school in Ghana where we had to create a school from scratch and I was trying to manage that with very tight resources at a distance so I'm here in London uh, the team is over there and you're trying to work through problems from a distance. So I've had quite a lot of experience of managing different types of teams in different settings. Um, and I wanted to draw out some insights from that. I'm mostly gonna talk about management. I'm also equally happy to talk about being an executive, being a black executive, dealing with some of the issues that come up uh, as you go through your journey. So you should feel free to ask any questions, whether they're management related, whether they're uh, related to being a, a minority and uh, working uh, uh, your way up from that point of view. I'm happy to take any of those uh, questions. Um, there are five insights that I wanted to share with you from my experience. Um, the first one is storm is the norm and I'll talk a bit about that uh, as I go on but basically people think they have problems with management and they think they're the only person having a problem as a manager and what I'm going to tell you is that that is just normal as a manager and you should expect it. The second is that the best sort of communication that you as a manager can learn is silence. Uh, and I'll explain how I learned that and why that's important. The third is that context is king and you need to learn as a manager how to tell stories that transfer the context that you want to get across to your team. The fourth is that as a manager and as a leader, you are not seeking agreement from your team. You are seeking something else, but definitely not agreement. And I'll explain why I say that. And the fifth and final is as a manager, if you're going to fire someone, then do it on a Thursday morning. Uh, and I'll explain why. So, so those are the five things that I'm going to run through briefly and then take questions. The first one, storm is the, new, is the norm. 
when I started as a manager at the London School of, at the uh, London Stock Exchange, I'd never managed anyone before. I was told that I now had to manage a team of four people uh, and I wasn't sure what to expect. So I spoke to one of the senior folk and said, you know, how do I do this? What should I keep in mind? And he said something to me that was, uh, that has been extremely useful. Was it useful at the time and has been extremely useful through my career? He said, remember that the process of working with a team is always form, storm, perform. That will happen every time you put a team together. You will put the team together, you'll assign everyone to their roles, you'll start working with them, and then at some stage, it'll start to go wrong and people will start to complain. They'll complain about you, they'll complain about each other, they'll complain about their role, uh, and then you'll sort that out and the team will start performing. And then later on in your career, you'll set up another team and the same thing will happen again. And you'll do it again, and the same thing will happen again. And he said, what you need to realize is that that is nothing to do with you as a manager or as a leader. It's nothing to do with awkward people in the team. That is exactly how teams come together. They always come together with some structure. They always go through a storming stage, and then they always start to perform after that. And if you realize that storming is just a natural part of putting a team together and running it, then you realize that it's not you failing as a manager, and it's not because your team is particularly awkward or difficult. That is just simply the dynamics of teams. And what I do now is if I put a team together and they're all behaving very well and they're all working well and it's all going smoothly, I will actually tend to provoke the storming stage because I know that any team needs to go through that storming stage. The elbows need to come out, people need to push each other around a bit in order to get the right shape and then we can get on uh, and do the job. So once you realize that as a manager, that it, it isn't you failing as a manager, it is the way that teams work. They always, always form, storm, perform. And if your team hasn't stormed yet, you, you as a leader need to make that happen in order to help people find their roles. So that was the first thing that I learned. The second thing was quite interesting that when I was a consultant at PricewaterhouseCoopers, I was an extremely intellectual, intense, driven young consultant. And I could present very well, I could absorb information fast, get the job done and so forth, write the reports. Um, something wasn't quite working. And one of the partners came to me and said, Tom, I think I know what the problem is with you. You listen too aggressively. Uh, and I said, I, I don't understand. What, what do you mean I listen too aggressively? And what he said is that my style of listening, because I was quite focused and intellectual, I would listen carefully to what the person was saying, but I would listen in a way almost as if I was going to challenge and attack at any point. Um, uh, I was, and therefore the person talking to me would be careful in what they were saying because they didn't want to trigger that. And he, what the point he was making is that there are as many different styles of listening as there are of talking. And usually when people think of leadership and think of communication, they think how they present as a leader. They think that the only communication skill is how you present, how you explain what you're doing. They forget that equally important is how you listen. How do you listen with quiet authority? How do you listen in a way that encourages your team to tell you what you want to know? How do you recognize that as a leader, as a manager, there will always be a filter. Your team will tell you things, but they're thinking that you're their boss, you're their manager. So there are things that they hold back that are equally important. And depending on how you listen, they will either tell you those things or not. So being told that I listen too aggressively and therefore adjusting my style of listening, learning to keep quiet, learning to be 
very open in the way that I listen in order to hear what my team is really saying, what's underneath the words that they're saying, was an absolute key communication skill that I had to practice as well. Like any communication skill, you have to practice it. So learning how to shut up, learning how to be silent, how to listen, how to ask the questions that get the other person talking are an absolutely key communication skill that is usually massively overlooked. The third thing is context. Your job as a leader, as a manager, is to share your context. Um, it is an incredibly powerful tool if you understand it. And the point about it is that if you can share your context in a way that is clear and compelling, then the people that work for you will get on and do the work anyway. They, they don't need you to tell them point by point what it is to do, what they need to do. What they need you to tell them, to explain to them, and what you need to do as the leader is to really articulate the context in a compelling way. Let me give you an analogy just to explain what I mean, because it can be a difficult uh, concept for people to grasp. Imagine you're coming home from work, not in these climbs, in a, in a sort of normal time. You've had a really hard day. You've had a stressful day. There have been arguments. There have been problems. You just want to get home. It's quite late in the evening. It's dark. It's raining. You're on the bus. You're upstairs on the bus. You're going through some papers that you're going to have to do, deal with the next day. And on the bus, there's, let's say, uh, a mum with a couple of children and she's just keeping quiet, looking out the window, and the kids are running up and down, they're making noise, they bash into you, and you just wish that they would sit down and be quiet, and, you, and so that you could just deal with the day that you've had, uh, and you're wondering why the mum isn't telling them to sit down and, and behave themselves and so forth. You're getting more and more irritated. And then somebody gives you the context that, that family is returning from a hospital, let's say, and that they've been to visit the dad and they've been told some bad news, the mother has been told some bad news, and when she gets home, she's going to have to tell the children. And all of a sudden, given that context, your attitude towards the situation changes completely. You want the kids to be as noisy as possible, you want them to have as much fun as possible because in a few hours time they're going to get some news that they don't want to hear. You want someone to support the, the mother and, uh, and you just you know, give her time and space. Now that you've got that context, your relationship with the situation changes completely. It is incredibly powerful. If you can transmit the context of what you're trying to achieve to your team in a way that they get, then that team will just get on and do the job. You won't need to tell them what to do. They'll know what to do. Too many managers and leaders spend their time in the task, telling their team what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and they forget that their job is to explain to the team why they're taking on this task, why we're going on this journey. When I was at Egg and I was uh, running the team there to launch the bank, after I left, I handed over to uh, another program director. And he said to me that he had been watching what I was doing as a leader and a manager during the six or seven months of the project while we were getting it launched. And he said what he noticed is that most of the time, what I did was to walk around telling stories. I just told stories about the bank, about what it was gonna be like in five years time, about how we were gonna work and so forth. He said, I seem to very rarely tell people what to do. I just told them why we were doing it. And then they were sufficiently inspired to go away and figure out what they needed to do and get on with it. And I would say to you as a leader, your job is to share that context, to be very clear on the context and to share that context over and over again with your team and check in with the team 
that they've understood the context and they know why we're doing it, then they will get on and actually do it. In order to do that, you come on to my fourth point, which is agreement and the fact that you as the leader are not trying to get everyone in your team to agree with you. That isn't the purpose uh, of this. What you're trying to do is to get people to align with your decision. So you are gonna have a conversation with your team and you are gonna be saying, my role is to lead this team. That's what I'm here to do. There will be multiple views multiple paths that we could go down. You are all intelligent people, you all have views, you all know what the risks are of different paths. And therefore, in a sense, it's impossible that we will all end up agreeing on the same thing. And I'm not going to try and convince all of you that you need to agree with me. What I am going to do as the leader, at some point when I've listened carefully to everyone, as the leader, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make my decision and I'm gonna say, we need to go that way. We need to go that way. And then I'm going to ask you, can you align behind my decision? You don't have to agree with my decision, but I need you to align with my decision. Again, let me give you an analogy. Let's say we're climbing a mountain and we're all experienced mountain climbers. Before we start, we have a discussion about what the best way is to go up that mountain. Some people say we should go up the left hand side. Some say we should go up the middle. Some say we should go up the right hand side. They all have their different views. They've all got huge amounts of experience. I'm the leader of this exhibition expedition. I'm going to decide at the end, having listened carefully to everyone, that we should go up the left hand side and now we all rope ourselves together and we set out on the journey but before we set out on the journey i need to look each of you in the eyes and say i know that some of you don't agree with this decision and that's perfectly fine you don't have to agree you you have your views as to why we should have gone up the middle or the right hand side but as the leader i have made the decision that we're going up the left hand side so can you align behind that decision? Because we can't go up that side, get halfway up, and then you start telling me that you don't agree with that and we need to go up one of the other ways. That can't happen. So before we start going on this journey, I need to ask you for alignment, not agreement. I don't need to keep trying to convince you that I've made the right decision and you should change your mind. I don't actually care whether you change your mind or not, but I do need you to align behind my decision because we're all tied together here. And if you can't align, I need to untie you and you can't come on that bit of the, that bit of the journey. That is just a fact. So when I'm managing, I am looking for alignment. I'm not looking for agreement. And I see a lot of managers and leaders spending a lot of effort trying to get everyone to agree with them, adjusting their plans. Well, will you agree if we do it like this? Will you agree if we do it like that? The direction and the plan and the certainty gets watered down in order to try and bring everyone on board. And actually, everyone isn't quite on board. I don't do that. I listen carefully to everyone. I weigh up all the risks. And then I say, we're going in this direction. Now, can everyone align behind this strategy in this direction? So don't look for agreement, look for alignment. The final thing is about feedback. Feedback as a manager is incredibly important. You're going to do it over and over and over again. It has to be authentic. It has to be clear and it shouldn't be aggressive. Sometimes people who are worried about giving feedback, they end up being a bit too aggressive, particularly if they're giving bad news. They, they get a bit sort of pushy, mainly because they're just nervous about giving feedback. So what I do is I always, when I'm giving feedback, try and say, 
this is what you do well, this is what you need to do differently. Do well, do differently. Every time you do this well, you need to do this differently. Because I need the person to hear the feedback that I'm giving them. And if they can't hear it, if they can't receive it, because it just feels too negative, they won't listen to it, they won't react to it. And if anyone in your team, if you've got anyone in your team, there are definitely things that they do well. And so why not tell them? Because you want them to do that even more. I remember a theatre director uh, explaining to me that when he was working with a, an actor uh, and trying to get them to perform well, the, the, what the actor had to do was to walk on the stage, walk to the middle of the stage and deliver a line to the audience. And there just wasn't the power in the way they were delivering the line. That just wasn't happening. But he liked the way they were coming onto the stage. And so his feedback to the actor was, look, the way you walk onto the stage, you are owning the stage. I love that and I need more of that. When you come on, you just own the stage. It's absolutely awesome. When you get to the front and deliver that line, I'm not getting the power that I need from that line. So I need something different from the way that you're delivering the line. So keep owning the stage, do more of that, take complete control of it the way that you are at the moment, and then deliver the line in the way that matches that. Do well, do differently. The actor hears all that and changes the way, and in fact goes away energized in order to change the thing that they, you want them to do differently and do more of the thing that you want them to do well. That do well, do differently is an absolute key tool. And as a manager and a leader, you will use something like that over and over and over again. At some points though, you'll have people that in your team, you just can't work with, they can't be in your team anymore. And as a manager and a leader, you will have to part company with people, whether you want to call it termination, uh, firing, letting go, etc. That is just something that you're going to do at multiple times in your career. So if, that, if you feel really uncomfortable with that, if the idea of letting someone go makes you feel like you don't want to do it, then my advice to you is don't be a manager, don't be a leader, because that will absolutely be part of what you do. In my career, I have probably had to let go, fire, terminate, um, make redundant, 300 or 400 people through my career, perhaps, of that order of magnitude, over and over again. It is just part of what you do. And therefore, you do it for the first time, it feels really uncomfortable, you do it again, you do it again, you get better at it. My advice is when you do it, you do it as a face-to-face -face conversation. You don't delegate it. You don't do it by email. You don't do it by text message. You do it very clearly. You sit down with the person and you don't sort of dance around and say, well, you know, things are difficult and this, that and the other in the hope that they'll figure it out for themselves. You just say to them directly, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid that you're going to have to leave this role and this is the reason why. You just say it right up front in the conversation so that there's clarity. They know why they're there, they've heard why they're there, and then you deal with it. I tend to do it if I'm going to do it on a Thursday morning. I always do it in the morning, not at the end of the day. If you do it at the end of the day, you spend the whole day thinking about it, they spend the whole day worrying about it, they know there's a meeting in the diary, at five o'clock, they don't know what it's about, they try and guess what it's about, uh, other, they tell other people, do you know why I've been asked to meet Tom, etc. Other people start guessing, you have a whole atmosphere. So you don't do that, you do it first thing in the morning, they come in, it's nine o'clock, you say, can I see you, come into the office, you explain what's going on, and then they leave pretty much straight away. And then you have the opportunity to say to the rest of your team, this is what you've done and this is why you've done it. You do it on a Thursday, not on a Friday, because you want to be able to see your team 
the next day and see how they've reacted to it. If you do it on a Friday, then everyone has the weekend to stew about it and talk to each other uh, and so forth. So always during the week, never uh, at the weekend. And you just do it clearly and in a very straightforward uh, way. Finally, I would say that if you're going to be a manager, if you're a manager already, that's great. Practice, practice, practice these things and just get better at it. If you want to be a manager, but you're not there yet, then you need to find ways of gaining experience. So look for volunteer opportunities, but look for volunteer opportunities either within your organization or outside your organization that give you the opportunity to manage projects and initiatives because that's what you're looking for. You want to put yourself in those situations where you're faced with storming, with listening, with creating context, with seeking alignment, with giving feedback so that you can practice these skills over and over again. So the five things that I have taken from my experience, the five insights that I wanted to share with you is that storm, storming in teams is normal. That's not strange, it is absolutely normal. The best type of communication is silence, by which I mean learn how to listen. Develop that skill as strongly as you focus on your communication skills. Context is king. Your job is to tell stories and create the context so that people will go off and do the work themselves. You are not seeking agreement. You don't need everyone to agree with you. What you need is to make a clear decision and then ask people to align with your decision and get really, really good at feedback. Do well, do differently. But if you can't work with someone, then give them a very clear message and make that separation happen. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions.